our 15 minutes of fame and I'd like to take a couple of my 15 minutes to talk about the rights and the wrongs in the world of professional wrestling. And it is the WWE Championship. This match is for the ECW World Heavyweight Championship. Welcome one, welcome all to another edition of the Rights and Wrongs of Pro Wrestling Podcast. This is your host, Mr. Green, and we are going into, what week is this? Week 92. Holy crap. Holy crap, indeed. Who would have thought that while 92 weeks later, we'd be still rolling on. Now, I didn't say rolling strong, but they're rolling on. With the ups and downs of the company, with the hiatus, with the beginning in 2000, stopping, being gone for 13 years, coming back, disappearing, coming back again, disappearing one more time, coming back again. Here we are. I would have not thought that 90, they're almost up on 100 weeks. Just think about it. Wow. Wow. And I mean that both as the promotion and as a, and as a statement of expression. Wow. <laughs> They've made it this far. Somebody, somewhere in that building, I will not say listen to me, but they listen to somebody. Like, stop taking these hiatuses. But, you know, that's that's neither here nor there. I'm going off, to, off into a tangent before I've even begun to show... This is Mr. Green. As stated earlier, you're listening to the Rights and Wrongs of Pro Wrestling Podcast. And did I give the show title? I don't know. I I know I'll get the the slate later, so we'll we'll get to that. I will just say that uh, my alternate show title was Revenge of the Jobbers, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss all of that as we go along fact we'll, we'll try to get to it as quickly as possible i find myself carrying on and on wild topic or subject matter tends to make me rant longer than i had generally anticipated but um i, I promise I'll, i will try to do better this particular episode so let us get into that um one thing i want to do because there's a little bit of um a question that was brought up, and I want to address that based on something that I witnessed personally. All right, so I guess we will officially say that this is the news, views, and updates section of the program. And as such, let's go through a couple of little, uh, I was going to say incident sounds like the wrong thing to say. A couple of little stories, a couple of little uh, uh, da, 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 da. <sighs> notes that have happened in the world of wrestling, particularly women's wrestling. Nothing massive. Uh, now, you know, we, we've had a couple of weeks with some big things to take a place. Crossovers was going on. Uh, Jordan Grace popping in at, to NXT. Uh, Tatum Paxley popping into TNA, which was a fun match, by the way. I don't remember if I talked about it, but it was a fun match. If you have um, TNA Plus, I will say you could enjoy that match. You can enjoy the entire pay-per-view. Pay-per-view is a loose term these days, but you can enjoy the entire event. I know a lot of people would tune in just for that. Um, but I thought they, they did a fine job of uh, really both ways in that Jordan Grace did not really lose anything. She lost the match, but it wasn't just like a straight up clear cut loss. They, you know, they muddied the waters a little bit. So she has a little an excuse. Paxley, however, went down clean. <laughs> that there was like mild interference or, or distraction, I guess, uh, just by the presence of Ash by elegance. 
But uh, by and large, the, the match was was a clean match, is, and I would say it's enjoyable. If you have not had the opportunity to um, take a look at it, I would. Um, <clears throat> the Owen Hart Cup tournament is has already begun. I guess it's not really much to say about that besides, you know, <laughs> keep your eyes open for it. Um Statlander has already defeated Nyla Rose in the first round. So she will be advancing. Uh, the other names that are involved in the cup, the Owen Hart Cup on the women's side at least, are the virtuosa Deanna Perrazzo, Hakuro Shida, Chris Statlander, as I just said, who defeated Nyla Rose, Mariah May, Soraya, Serena Deeb, and Willow Nightingale. I, I really don't have a dog in this fight. I honestly got more invested in the male side of the tournament, and that was largely because of a promo that Jeff Jarrett delivered, and it was it was a masterful promo. Masterful. Uh <laughs> I need to write a note down so I can get back to that <laughs> because there, there's a point to me bringing up the fact that he did a promo because, well, you know what? I might as well just get into it now before I forget. So let's just take a quick leap over into Wildland. Outside of review, we're just going to talk about an overall problem that exists in WoW, and that is that their promos either do not go anywhere or it, their cases of or it feels like. Let me let me make sure I say this right. It feels like it's just repeat, repeat. What word is that? What is that? What was I going? At? Regurgitated, <laughs> regurgitated verbiage that has been written down for them to repeat. See, I was getting those all that jumbled in together for them to repeat once they're on camera, and none of it. Well, very few has the passion or the heart behind it. And it's almost as if if you're healed, they're scared to let you make people mad. If you're a baby face, you can't do anything impassionately. It's, it seems to be missing the boat in that regard. We're, and again, we're talking about WoW and the promos that they've given. Almost every promo I've seen in the last couple of months has been... A David McLean hosted event, which he essentially becomes as big of a component in that segment as the person talking, as the person that's being interviewed, because he's leading them towards wherever it is that he's trying to get them to go. But they usually do not get the opportunity to just go deep and say, look, you know, I got something to say. Give me the microphone. Let me let me say what I want to get off my chest here it doesn't happen but those are the things that help sell events those are the things that help sell tickets those are the things that help sell the personality the comparable that i was just getting at was the jeff jarrett promo and jeff put up this promo on instagram you can probably seek it out where and if anybody is aware of him in the attitude area, you know that he and Owen Hart were tag team partners and friends. So he was asked, according to him, he was asked to be in the Owen Hart Tournament Cup on the male side, obviously. And he gives this promo and he's talking about um, when he was asked all the feelings that he had, even though it's been 25 years, they all came flooding back to him. And what Owen meant to him. And that the night, the day after Owen died, he said, I made a promise to his kids. And he said it to his kids. He said, but I promised I was going to say it when it meant something to him. And they would understand it, that their father was a good man. And you could see and feel, more importantly, you could feel the emotion that this man had while he was talking about Owen. Now, I have no doubt that a portion of that promo was a work. I have no doubt about that. But I also have no doubt that the emotion that he had in there was genuine. 
And you're seeing him talk about this, talk about the wounds and how it affected him, just them bringing it up. And 25 years later, it still got him emotional, made him cry. Talking about telling his his friend, Owen's kids, who were too young at the time to really get something you know, out of being told, hey, your father was a good guy and this, that, and the other. But they're old enough now. And he's talking about a promise. And he's saying it with such stern conviction in his face and feels like in his heart. And he ends this thing with, I'm going to do it. It's like, now I question whether AEW is going to do the right thing. It's like, come on. I know they got this whole idea of, well, there's no such things as heels and baby faces. But this is a baby face promo. It's an absolute baby face promo. And people should, you know, I can see if, if Jeff managed to get people to root for him out, out of this because he is the closest thing in that company to somebody who is, you know, relative to Owen Hart. Saying I'm going to do it. He has skin in the game. That is a promo. Where are those in WoW? Where are those moments? Where are the promos like that? Where they can pull you in and make you want to see the next episode. I, I, I miss out on a lot. Of I don't think they, they have them. And maybe outside of the uh, Sofia Lopez moment. Maybe not be capable of doing it. But as a whole different thing. Like I said, I, I know I jumped off of... Uh, off my path here because I saw the Owen Hart tournament news and my notes and kind of drifted off there and there was no time like the present. So we have that. NXT makes its official move to the CW Network October 1st. We talked about that several months back and this is going to be the difference. They are not going to just be on CW as an app in the way that um, uh the NWA is. They will exist on the CW just in general. Now, the NWA, as far as I know, as far as I've read, will remain on there. Also, it should be noted that the CW has kind of quietly altered the app. If you're used to or you've seen Pluto TV or if you have seen um, uh, the, the Roku channel, the Roku app, they have almost like their own internal cable service, if, if you will, streaming service, where it's got its internal guide and stuff like that. That is what um, the CW app is becoming. So I don't know if that's going to do any good for them overall, because there was a point in time I was like, NWA might as well have just stayed on YouTube because it, more people will watch that than they ever will the CW app. But it, but they may be playing the long game. This is a new element in that. Because it took a while for certain channels that were not uh, premium streaming channels, like your Max or your Paramount Plus or... Uh, da, da, da. Why am I blanking on another, <laughs> another Disney Plus, Netflix? That's, I was blanking there for a second. But it, it, it's not like those. It took them a while to get this, the, the free apps like your Tubies, your Crackles, your um, Pluto TVs. But the last time I read any news uh, on streaming apps, those three specifically have grown in uh, viewership. Probably, largely because they're free and some people just like, look, I'll deal with the commercials, just I don't want to pay for it. And that's great. All of that to say is that, you know, the NWA may not be in the same position that the WWE is in as it relates to uh, being on the CW as a network opposed to the app. But they could work out okay depending on how the app works going forward. I will be keeping my eyes out on that. Also, I'll be keeping my eyes out on NXT because they've become very interesting lately. 
Did you see Joe Hendry show up on NXT? That was cool stuff. Frank Kazarian, too. Good stuff. Uh, Kayla Braxton announced her departure from WWE. She had been there for eight years as a backstage interviewer, and now she is stepping out, stepping away from the WWE. Uh, she posted on, um, was that her Twitter? No, her Instagram. She posted on the Instagram, uh, letting people know that this was going to be the the end of her run in WWE, stating that she had, of course, appreciated the opportunity, the time, the people that she wanted to thank. Now, this is just cause for somebody to give a, a whole speech about, hey, I want to thank this person. I want to thank that. I appreciate the opportunity that WWE gave me because she's leaving on her own terms. It's not like she got fired and then she's like, well, I want to thank the WWE for all the time to get... You know, but I don't I don't know why that has become like a thing in pro wrestling. If you get fired out of a company, the first thing that you gotta do is get online and start thanking them for the opportunity that they gave you for whatever times that you were there. I I just never understood that. That's but that's just me. So anyway, here in her case, I get that. I understand. Because as stated in her Instagram, she's uh, moved out to the West Coast and, according to her, has been offered new opportunities that will further utilize the skills that she gained working at WWE. So there is a a, a point to a thank you, as it should be, in this situation. You let go. I don't know. I really don't understand. You get let go, I should say. I really don't understand why you go through all that, but, you know, that's that's just me. I said, just move on, and maybe one day you'll go back. I don't see what the big deal is. Well, you got to go through, thank you for Triple H for hiring me and you know and all that. If you ain't said it to him before you got fired, then you probably should have said it sooner. Uh, lastly, what was my, I got to flip through my papers now to find my, uh, last bit of news here before I get off into the, the thing. Uh, Willow Nightingale, uh, she advances in the Owen Hart Cup as well. Probably should go ahead and, and win this thing. Now that's me, but she already lost the championship. We knew that she was kind of a placeholder for that, but um, she seems to have a good fan base, so I I think I want to pull for Willow, at least until I see somebody else that uh, may have come along and escaped past her. But I think I'm pulling for Willow Nightingale here. So we'll we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. See if it affords her some, uh, <clears throat> some victories. And uh, she's got two more to go as far as I am aware to, to make it to the championship. Hopefully she'll do it. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to uh, address a, a comment or question that was presented to me. And that question was in relation to the episode that had Sophia Lopez um, announce her diagnosis or the fight that she was in with uh, breast cancer. And then that was followed up with uh, Steffi Slays giving a speech on behalf of Jay Boogie about being bullied. And the question was, what, what issue did I have with that? The fact that it was two of them in one night didn't, you know, was not that big of an issue in, in this person's uh, uh, opinion. And that's fine. I, and I, I get that. But I did say that I'll explain why I felt the way that I felt. And is this. When you have a pretty strong emotional moment in a television show, movie, or wrestling environment, I genuinely do not like if they follow right behind it with another emotional moment <laughs> following the emotional moment. You know, it, it, it's almost like it doesn't give time for the original one to really sink in and, and you to kind of internalize that a little bit if that makes sense 
especially on a wrestling show, it's hard enough to come by those moments to begin with, especially ones that are genuine or that people can feel. The Sofia Lopez moment was something that people can feel because it went beyond being a, well, here's the character of Sofia Lopez having an issue. No, it was, it went beyond that. It went to this person that portrays Sofia Lopez as fighting with this disease that has affected a lot of people and a lot of families, you know, across the board. So there's a very good chance that you could understand that you could sympathize or empathize or whatever. And then they followed it up with, you know, Steffi Slays and, you know, I've had enough and this bully, you know, it's, looks like what was meant to be an emotionally charged moment. The issue there is that you cannot follow one with the other, typically. Now, in the the live house is probably fine because it looked like, you know, the Lopez thing was, was video and then you had that. And relatively speaking, because all this is taped. But I'm just saying that the, that the point that it took place is very, probably very likely that one took place on the one night and the other took place on the next one. So it wasn't close enough in real life that it was an issue on TV. That's a different thing. The example that I had was this. And it it was a, (laughs) it wasn't a horrible night (laughs) in our little wrestling community, but it was one of those things. was like, seriously, like you're, you're going to do this here for this thing. And it'll make sense in in a little bit. So, some of you may or may not know that I uh, worked with or for uh, Robert Gibson's promotion here in Georgia at the, for about three and a half years. That was uh, APCW, All Pro Championship Wrestling, and I probably can tie in multiple things in this as as examples of what to do and what not to so at this particular time he being the promoter and the participants involved stumbled across what turned into a pretty good feud for them with that promotion that being Landon Hale taking on Eric Adams Eric Adams being the the veteran Landon Hale being the babyface Landon had been beaten, even though he was cheated out of several victories. He had been the end result was that he had been beaten several times by Eric Adams in a row. To the point that he called Eric Adams a coward at one show and basically said, Well, you know, he, he didn't have the guts to get back in here with, with, with me. And Eric said, Oh, well, you want to talk about guts? I'll show you guts. I I'm willing to put my career on the line. I'll shut you down before you even go anywhere. If you you want me again. Put your crew up and I'll cut your legs out underneath you before you get started. Which was an interesting twist. He had this rookie put his career on the line. And he, you know, he's a young, good looking guy. And he was in college at the time. His classmates was coming to see him. Um, you know, people that he worked out with, teachers and whatnot. And so, you know, at the show he did. And they was building this angle around that. Career versus career, right? And by all wrestling logic, particularly what had been happening up there at that point, you figured the babyface has to come out on top. He has to. He, there's no way that he can go into this thing and lose, right? So they have the match. Eric Adams somehow overcomes by hook or my crook, and he wins. Defeats. Boom. One, two, three. Now, keep in mind, like I said, that night, it was a a big show for um, APCW and Landon in general. I am almost of the belief that he sold that place out on his own because they were interested in him. They wanted to see his his friends and family and all that. They, They wanted to see what he was going to do. And so, you know, they, they showed up and they, 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 they watched and they were 
gobsmacked by the fact that he lost. They couldn't believe it. There was, you know, you, you saw jaws drop. You saw people crying, legitimately crying in the crowd. And he was great. Got in the ring and he's teared up and he's he's milking it for everything he's worth. And his he didn't tell anybody. I, I have to give him credit. He did not tell anybody. So he does all of this in the ring, and you know he's hugging people that they're walking up to him. Get, you know, I'm sorry, man. Uh, you know, they just figured that he had you know lost because he was dropping out to go to school. He was studying to be a doctor. So and so the people that knew that figured that oh okay maybe he did lose the people that weren't smart to it figured oh well he just lost it was a great moment and that led right into the inter, you know the intermission and it's like oh i mean with everybody felt the, the, that room you know and it took a moment to bring it down so they could get ready for the main event the problem here, getting back to the, and I know you was wondering, where does this relate to two emotional moments? The problem there was is that in the main event, there was a triple threat. And one of the individuals in that triple threat, I probably could name his name, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. It is an episode uh, APCW 44, anybody that's interested in looking. But one of the individuals in that triple threat had taken it upon himself on his own social media, and we didn't know this at the time, that he was talking to his fans saying, well, if I don't win the title, I'll retire. No one knew this except for him. (laughs) Not, Not the promoter, not Robert Gibson, not the people he was in the ring with, not me, (laughs) no nobody. So he has the match, he does everything, and then he comes up short and he loses. People are going out, and then he he's trying to create this emotional moment of of stepping down, taking his boots off, and putting it in the ring. I'm recording all this, and out the side of my eye, I'm looking in the in the entrance corridor, and I'm seeing uh, Robert Gibson standing there, and he's like, "What in the fuck is this guy doing?" But the, and people are walking out because they didn't know they didn't know he was going to do that. They had no idea that there was a stipulation attached to it to begin with, because he just created it. And he did, and more or less, he did, he just decided to hijack the show. No, no one knew. I've asked several people from that point out. Like, did you know he was going to do that? No, nobody knew it. He was trying to suck the emotional uh, situation that had happened. 30 minutes, 40 minutes earlier and get a similar, if not the same or better response. And it just didn't work out. It, it wasn't anything that you could give him. And it's like, he didn't understand it. He was a fantastic wrestler, enjoyed his matches and he was a good guy. I liked him. Never had a problem with him. Sat down, you know, talked with him a couple of times, but for whatever reasons, he's like, he, I should be the ch- like his ego got in the way of it. I mean, there's no other way to put it. As as cool of a guy as he was, his ego got in the way of what he was doing, and the fact that he did not get the belt that night made him just take his ball and go home. Now that's beside the point. The point here is is that that crowd did not know what to make of it. That crowd didn't care. They didn't know what was coming up. They and when it happened. Just the virtue of him being uh, sad and getting ready to quit didn't do anything for him. They were already emotionally drained for the very same reasons 30 to 40 minutes ago. Somebody had already lost their career. Somebody had already had to give it up. Somebody already st- stood in the ring and gave, made their goodbyes and hugged everybody and had fans crying and everything like that. And then for him to try to turn around and get it again, 40 minutes later was a fool's errand and he tried it just didn't work no one was interested no one was invested in it no one cared and you know never mind if that's one thing but just <clears throat> the fact that 
it was so close to and so similar to what had just ha- happened. Where were we going to go from that? Now, needless to say, he never showed back up in that promotion. <laughs> uh, once he was out, he was that was it. And I think they had a little bit of falling out past that point. But yeah, the, he never showed back up in it. But the point there being it was too similar and too close together for that to have worked. And he just couldn't do it. So because of that, I am like, you know what? Let's space these emotional moments out. It probably, if if they had waited one week, just one week, if they had buffered out the whole BK Rhythm, Steffi Slays moment one week later, would it have really mattered? Would you really lost anything off of that? If they had just separated it with with that week's worth of time, and she does the same thing, to say, you know, would would it have really taken anything off of it? I don't think so. I think it'd have been fine. So that's the reason why. To answer the question, that's that's a large part of the reason. I didn't. I don't necessarily like it. Like I said, in in TV and shows like that in general. But I especially am not fond of it in wrestling, and I do realize that it is in large part because of incidents like that. That one specifically like taught me this is not a good idea, and everybody needs to be on the same page. But like I said, that's a, that's a whole different thing. So I, I wanted to make sure that I addressed and commentated on that before i went any further because i felt like uh having got that message like well i didn't really see a problem with why Steffi slays messes up the show for you and like she did fine in her delivery she did fine and the conviction of this has got to stop and being the baby face and stuff like that she did fine in that i would even go so far as to say she did great she took what was essentially subpar material and elevated it but beyond that it was the wrong place for it that's all it was just the wrong place it it would have had more impact overall had that been in a different environment different show different segment where it did not have to follow somebody with real world implications it just seemed like a wrong place to to put it Okay, so did I did I cover everything there? I think I did. Uh, so I'm gonna take this little bit of opportunity here, and before we go off into the uh, review, I'm gonna give my little pause, take a break, and when we come back, we'll go right off into the review of Wow, Women of Wrestling. And we're back. So here we go. The slate for this episode. Wow. Episode 240. Chronological number 92, as we talked about earlier at the show. They've uh, made a major accomplishment there. The air date, June 15th. And the title of the episode, Dangerous Divas. We told you it was going to get back to that. And there it is. And the alternate title was Revenge of the Jobbers. Provided by me. Because that's basically what this episode was. So, let us start. And before I even begin going... It is not going to always be a case of the match being bad or something along those lines. It is more a case of where did this come from? Where is this going? Does this make sense to me? And all based on angles, storylines, plots, whatever you may have it that have come and gone within the world of WoW. And uh, it's either was anticlimactic, unresolved, or somewhere in between. All right. So at the beginning of the show, the commentators start off recapping the issues between Jay Boogie and the Brat Pack. I guess they they wanted to lead off with that. McLean says, 
very clearly. And I, you know, I, anybody that's listened to this knows that I see this show several times in the room that I'm in. It, it will literally travel from left, from right to left, east coast to west coast in the room that I'm in. It will go from Atlanta right to Los Angeles. Monitor by monitor, a couple, couple of hours in between, but you get what I'm saying. <clears throat> so, in general, I will see it like twice in my station. If I try to go and look at it on somebody else's feed, I might you know see it somewhere else. But the point being is that there's there's a little bit of access to it in the room, so I I will see it and then. Sometimes, like now, I was like, "Did what? Did he just say that?" So, when the show starts, Dave McClain clearly says, "We're going to see Jay Boog in singles action," only to be followed by the ring announcer like three seconds later saying, "The following contest is a tag team match." We hadn't made it two minutes into the show, and I already had something I was like, "What in the hell is going on here?" How is he not aware of what match that they have? Is this not written or formatted? Did they? Did somebody just change it? Did he say it and mess up and just be like, well, no one cares, so I'm not going to worry about doing ADR on this or taking that commentary out? They could have just clipped him at the, at the end or something. But none of those things happened. The mistake got left in. And, yeah, look, I understand Sometimes some mistakes just just leave them in there. It there is such a thing as that it adds an element of realism to it, but not to the level of stupidity. Like I, I don't want to be on air saying something that's wrong to the show that I am producing. Is it is one thing for me to have a slip up while I'm doing commentary? That because. Every commentator does that. I've done it. People that I know around here have done it. People that's on national TV have done it. You know, basketball, football, you name it. Everybody has a little slip up in their commentary. It, it just that's just part of the gig. But nothing like that. Nothing like that. As, at the very least, I'm supposed to know what's on my own program. And it this came off like he had no ideas. Like, yeah, it's gonna be a singles match. And then to have that, it's like, okay, well. Either he forgot, didn't pay attention, didn't write it down, not formatted, all of the above, who knows. So he does that, and then we go into this next segment, which is uh, the match in and of itself. It's the Brat Pack, Gigi Gianni and BK Rhythm taking on Lil J Boogie and Steffi Slade. Now, that'll be the last time I refer to as Lil J Boogie. No, I hate that, that name. It's just J Boogie. And I don't even care for that, but that's better than the other one. Uh, so the commentators are carrying on about her being bullied. This feels like we have just done this story. That was one of the issues that I have right there. It feels like we've already done this. Didn't did we not just do this with Steffi Slays? Uh, Ah, she's being bullied, and she's got to get. It's like it's almost the same thing. It's almost the same angle. It's it's another idiot baby face, who for whatever reasons got tied up with the heels, who the world could see doesn't want them around except them. Well, I guess I'm not gonna say it about Boogie because they actually acted like they wanted her around for a while. I'll give her that. But the rest of that is pretty much the same. Once your usefulness is done, okay, well, you're out of here. And now, you know, the commentators have to, well, you know, they was bullied and bullied and bullied and bullied. Like, what did they do that was bullied? Now, yes, they turned on her. They attacked her. Hit her in the head with her own, uh, well, you know, theoretically. Hit her in the head with her own boombox. But up until that point, she was essentially treated as an equal part of the team. So where was the bullying there? Every, you know, somebody once said that the term being buried is overused by fans in wrestling. 
Somebody told me that once. Like, you know, it, it, these fans, it, anytime something goes wrong, it's buried. They buried this. You buried that. You buried it, buried it, buried This is one of those things that, like, I'm feeling that way about wow and the term bullied. Yes, bullying is is a, is a horrible thing. I I get it, but every little mean spirited thing that happens to you is not a resolve of you know of being bullied. It's not the result of that. To you know, at least not in my definition. To me, bullying is like an ongoing issue. I am, you know, you could be bullied, singular, but bullying, the way that they describe it, is like this happens week in and week out, and they, they just done nothing but just give you crap over and over and over again. Those things never happen. It never happened with the Brat Pack. They got sick of her, and they kicked her out of the group physically, but they, but they did not bully her into that. It'd been different if they gave her like a you know a verbal tirade and you know had her carry the bags and you ain't nothing without us and did that you know if that carried on for a couple of weeks then I was like yeah that is a bullying angle but this is just a pro wrestling angle somebody got turned on they got jumped and we're out for revenge that's it so I don't know where they keep going with this bullying thing never mind the fact that. <laughs> I said before they had a the the bully buster in the building, but for some reason she has never been involved in any sort of quote bullying angle. And yet they've used that term with three different people in three different storylines. Whether I agree with the angle or not, or whether I think the the angle is good or not, at least three different times that has been utilized within somebody's story whether that be santana garrett saying i came back to help you know to stop the bullying in the locker room whether that be <clears throat> ariel sky she's being bullied by top tier whether that be this with boogie bullied by bk rhythm and, and gg gianni none of the, this has ever involved keto rush surprising so anyhow, uh, this starts up the way that you would expect to start up. BK Rhythm drops one of her raps like normal. There's no reason at all to go into what she said here. It is pointless. Um, the match is the, the thing to, to be watched here, and it's, it's not all that long. The match is probably every bit of four and a half to five minutes. So it's a it's, it's, uh, Pretty basic match. Uh, I will admit, and Zentara, this will be for you, since uh, according to you, I am now the head of uh, Boogie's, uh, president of her fan club. <laughs> but I will admit, this is probably the best that she has looked. Now, I don't know if that's high praise or not, considering her time in this match is fairly limited. I mean, she she got a, a couple of good arm drags in and stuff like that, but by and large, th th this is a very limited performance by Boogie. <clears throat> Steffi Slays was in there a little bit more than that. So, take her being, this being her best performance with a grain of salt. Nothing overly complicated here or anything like that. It's just she has the match. Uh, Steffi starts off with her, but uh, Boogie eventually tags in, and she she gets her moment in the sun. She gets to toss uh, Gigi Gianni around. Gigi does some pretty good arm drags for her. Gianni looks great, as I generally say with her. Rhythm also looking good in the ring. However... My opinions about the team are slowly beginning to change. I, and I feel so bad saying that. I, I do. And it's nothing that they did. It's nothing that they did to make me feel it. It's, it's what Wild did to them that makes me feel this way. And we'll get there. So, uh, Slays gets back into the ring, and eventually they start getting the heat on her. Gianni, uh, Dodges a, a offensive charge by Slays, and that's when they start getting the heat on her from that point out. 
They keep her in the ring long enough to get Boogie the, I guess, the the hero's charge when she gets tagged in and she can come in and clean house. Right? Not before the Brat Pack do a fairly decent tandem move. It probably could use a little bit more timing behind it. Uh, it was a like a schoolgirl trip and then a senton splash combination. It, it Like I said, it would have been a little nicer if, if the timing was a little bit more instantaneous, but it wasn't bad. But Slayers is able to kick out of that, and she is able to get what I would consider somewhat of a cold tag over to uh, uh, BK, BK, brother, over to Boogie. Gianni almost carries Slay's into her corner. Like she has in body slam launch position, which is a nice show of strength, actually. Takes her from the middle, walks her over to her corner. Slay's is able to slip down behind her, shows her off, and then she just runs over to her partner and tag. That's why I was like, well, that was a pretty cold one, but, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll just go with that. So Boogie comes in, and she comes in the, the old proverbial house of fire. She ducks underneath a clothesline, catches rhythm with like two drop kicks in a row, <laughs> hits her with ends of Geary. BK is selling, selling, selling. She's got a, a, a good dazed look in her eyes. Rhythm, not rhythm, uh, Boogie gets a, a cover. Gianni pops in and makes the save. Charges over there that Steffi slays and forearms her off the apron, which I thought was really good. It's like, okay, yeah, that that is a tag team heel move of desperation. It, my partner's down. We're in trouble. I got a clean house right now. So, I, so again, with this team, I, I, I like the team. I just don't know where they're going to go because of this. The Both of them are in the ring. They shoot uh, – Jay Boogie into the ropes. She comes off, ducks underneath a double clothesline. Real waist locks BK Rhythm in, in the attempt to try to get her down. But Gigi Diani is holding her up, so she can't pull her, her partner away for a pin. Slays hops over into the ring, and she drop kicks Gianni, who does a wonderful bump like she always does. And then Boogie gets the roll up, and she gets the pin. One, two, three, and... and there we go. Little J Boogie. I, I said I wasn't going to say that, didn't I? J Boogie wins the match for her team with the roll-up. And I wrote down at that point, so the Brat Pack can't be a rookie either. Like, come on, man. Is that this, this team is done. It's done. I wanted so much for them. I did. But I, I cannot imagine why they would have lost. First, this feud, if we want to call it that, is it over with? I mean, it just culminated with this one, this match here, and then boom, we're done. Like, where, why would they come back to it? She just beat her bulliers or oppressors or whatever you want to call them. She just won. She just won clean. So... Where is this supposed to go? Where was this? Where can it go? So she gets that. The Brat Pack lost to the person that they claimed was responsible for them losing all the time. And I, it's not that we don't want to see Jay Boogie overcome and or succeed. I just thought that there was a way for them to do that and leave the door open or get some more mileage out of this. Let's just say that Jay Boogie was going to win and Gianni cuts her off and, you know, I don't know, comes out the top rope, leg drop on the back of the head and lets BK Rhythm get the pin and, you know, one, two, three, but <clears throat> you let Boogie get her heat back out of the match by doing something that allows her to stand tall and say on the microphone that I'm not done with you. I will get my, you know, another match one of these days and I'll get even. She 
sometimes you just need the the character character. I, I really don't even like using those terms, but sometimes you just need to have the wrestler be able to stand tall. They don't always have to win, but they need to be able to stand tall so that the fans get something out of that moment rather than the victory, if that makes sense. But this was neither. She won pretty clean and undisputed victory. I don't know where you go with this. And I don't know where you go with the Brat Pack. What else can they do? They, they could not even beat this person that wow commentators are calling a rookie. So what good are they? They lose constantly to begin with. This just made it worse. For a team that just got put together, and not to mention the fact that Steffi Slay's win-loss record, despite the fact that Wild's trying to portray her as, well, she's a Wild veteran, despite the fact that they want to portray her as that, let's remind ourselves here. Over 10 years, I will bet you Steffi Slay's has less than 50 matches overall. Over 10 years. She has less than that. I can I, I can guarantee you that. And that's a problem. How, how is she supposed to be somebody's veteran? It's, you know, and I should take that back. It's not a problem within the WOW. It would be a problem if she goes someplace else. As long as she's in WOW, then she, she's perfectly fine. She's top of the heat. But the point of me saying that is that the Brat Pack could not be a rookie teamed up with somebody whose win-loss record is moderate at best. And I'm being generous to say that because last time I did a full episode where I went through her record at that time. And that was, uh, when did I do that? I, I did that in October. At that time, she had 34 matches in 10 years. 34 matches in 10 years. I went through all of them. And of those 34 matches, again, this is in October, she had 23 losses and 11 wins. That's not the presentation of a top person. That's not the presentation of a, of a world beater or a veteran, somebody that knows what it looks like they, they're doing in the ring. So we adding that into it, it's like, I don't know if this – Makes a lot of sense to me. But whether it makes sense to me or not, they won. This should not continue on. And I hate to say it, but like I said, I think the Brad Pack's done. I really I do. I like I I really like that team. I did. But I think they're finished now. I don't know. Where or how they could be repaired. But I don't think WoW is going to be capable of doing it. I, I just, I've lost faith that they have the means or the method to try to make them into any sort of valuable commodity for that company. The best thing that I can tell them to do, or if, if they took my advice at all, I wouldn't leave WoW. But if I could arrange some matches where I, where the two of them can go as a unit outside of it and possibly build up the team, I would do that. Maybe you can get someplace else. Because if you're looking for a career elevation out of why I do not believe that that's the place for it. I, I, I don't think that is going to make any difference in your careers whatsoever. <sighs> so there we go. That that team's done. It's over and done. The next segment was the next match. Los Banditas versus Santilla Chella and Holiday. And it's like repeating what we just got out of in the first match. Circumstances change. And now we uh, suddenly somebody who wasn't worth a crap in the beginning 
can win. And that applies here to Los Panditas. So the commentators start up talking about Sofia Lopez and her breast cancer diagnosis. Um, and the Banditas are the ones that come out first. And keep in mind that this is Los Banditas version two. Rivera is no longer in the, in the group. Angel Rose is there along with Sylvia Sanchez. And neither they no longer have a manager. It's just them. Now, with Los Banditas remaining heel, having lost underneath the manager over and over and over and over again, and the manager going babyface, you would kind of believe that, okay, well, Los Banditas ain't worth nothing. So, <laughs> so maybe they would probably come out here and suck just as bad as they've been doing for the last two or three months. But no, that did not happen, actually. And we will go off into that. So the man, the, man, the commentators are talking about, you know, this odd couple that exists with Chantilla Chella and Holiday. I don't mind the odd couple deal. I just think that they're not getting any mileage out of it because part of the old odd couple trope is that you actually see them at odds. <laughs> Even if they're not being mean to each other, you see how one person addresses one thing versus the other. If there ever was a time for them to do vignettes, is this. And I'm not even a big fan of them doing vignettes. But if there ever was a time, this is it. Why, why would they not do it with these two? where they could get some kind of mileage out of it. But it didn't seem like that's something that's happening, unless they're taping them now and we haven't watched them yet. But they never take advantage of that situation. Uh, this match was seemingly fine, but it did have a rough spot or two <laughs> in the course of this. Uh, one of those being the tandem move of Chantilla Chella being kind of leapfrog tossed into the corner to take on one of the members of Las Banditas, and Chella came up just a little bit short. Now, in her not her defense, but the whoever edited this, she should probably thank. And that he he made it so it wasn't just blatantly obvious. He, he tried to tried to cut the angle to where when she came down, it, it cut right on the action. Well, you know, they switched the camera angle to where it wasn't just you could see the distance between the drop. That let me put it that way. But it, yeah, if if you're looking at it, I'm thinking it's pretty obvious that she did not clear this this toss. So anyhow. The match in of itself is not really important because overall this is kind of a cold match. It's not not building on anything. It's not as the result of anything. It's just a match that just happened to be taking place. Uh, there were spots that gave the baby faces an out. And they weren't just beaten. So in, in the terms of the structure of the match, I, I thought it was fine. The whole, you know, Holiday is tagged in. She's ready to clean up house. She's, she's the bigger, stronger of the two. She's the recognized powerhouse and the recognized more dangerous of the two. But the referee don't see it. And so Chantilla Chella, who's tired and wow, well, I has to get back in. Angel Rose runs across and she yanks Holiday's uh, foot off the apron. So she's out of the picture. And Chella, who's on her last leg, get caught in a power slam and then boom, one, two, three. So structurally speaking, I didn't have a problem with the match. I don't know what, let me just stop for a second before I continue. I don't know what Dave McClain was calling it. What is a spinning drop? Sanchez pins Chella with a spinning drop. I mean, I guess you can make up whatever name you want, but by and large, we've always called it a power slam. I don't know why it just suddenly changed that 
Maybe he lost his train of thought and he couldn't get it out. I was like, but when I heard it, I was like, what? what is that? So, anyhow, she pins him, pins her, and that's it. The Las Vegas can win now. Which then takes me back to, all right, so what am I supposed to be getting from this? What, what, was this a case of Las Banditas was good and Sofia Lopez was a bad manager and caused them to lose? Was she holding them back? I don't know if that's the narrative that I would necessarily want to go with for my new babyface manager that she somehow was incompetent and caused the team to lose. I think it would have been the other way around. They didn't listen to what I was saying and, you know, or something like that. That's why I was like, I don't I don't know where they're going with this. It's, are they trying to say that the Banditas were better than Lopez or are they saying that Lopez really was good and they just didn't listen? Because it ain't clear. But in either case, now all of a sudden after – weeks and weeks and weeks of losing and them dropping Sofia Lopez, now they won. So I'm I'm forced to believe that Sofia Lopez as a manager just wasn't any good. But I cannot possibly believe that that is the message that they want to share. Anyhow, did I forget to mention uh, another thing about Jay Boogie that just Stroke my nerve, but you know I don't, I don't think we got there yet because they did have a video package. So I I will uh, save my next statement for when we get to that. So anyhow, Los Bandidos wins. I am not really aware of what they were trying to relate with this with this win, but I guess Sofia Lopez was the weak link of this. The next segment they do a recap of the Beast winning the Wild Championship. And I wrote down as I was watching this, this is nice to see, dot, 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 but didn't promote anything or lead to any new angle. It's just kind of there. That is my exact note. And I would, after giving it time, I still stand on that. Sometimes I change my mind about these things I write, but I still stand on that. It was nice video. But it doesn't do anything. It didn't. It didn't lead into a main event. Didn't lead into a, a interview segment where she kicks off a new feud. Didn't. Didn't address some past unresolved issue that you know needs to be brought back around. None of that. It's just. It was just a recap of her winning the title, and it, it didn't. Didn't lead to anything beyond that so uh -huh. next match is team iq superior versus the dojo defenders you remember them the dojo defenders it's been a couple of weeks but i guess there's they're still around or they've returned i'm not even sure the last time that we've seen the dojo defenders that what is it, it has been a significant chunk of time i'm guessing i'm gonna say it's probably been ooh, two months maybe let's find out let me see let me, let me go through my papers here as you know i have notes on these things for weeks so i'm gonna start off in may and see how it goes from the we're, we're in may there was no match of them there no match of them there. Still in May. No matches da, 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 there. And if I remember, it would be Miami Sweet Heat that I'm looking for them up against. There's Miami Sweet Heat. End of May against Chella and Holiday, that we who we just saw a match with them lose there. Uh, that's Lost Banditas and uh, Torment. Uh, oh wow, this is this is a ways back. Holy crap! Has it has it been this long? 
Woo. I mean, I got to go backwards like the march. Exile Team Spirit and the Mother Truckers. I mean, just I'm just seeing all these things, and I haven't seen the Dojo Defenders yet. I mean, I know they didn't just pop up out of the complete blue. Ah, here it is. Okay, I started in May. I should have started a month earlier. The Dojo Defenders debuted and haven't been seen since May. Against, yeah, against Miami's Sweet Heat. Episode... 82. So we are talking a good 10 weeks. Something like that. Yeah. It's been a while. And what a way to leave them, you know. Having lost to Miami Sweet Heat and losing here. So anyhow... Yeah, that was a spoiler. Anyhow, Team IQ <laughs> Superior as represented by the class master and the disciplinarian, which, I don't know. Class master still looks silly to me. And she presents as a campy wrestler. I have already said, given her height and stature, it would probably get more mileage out of them to repackage her into being a badass rather than being a goof. But that's what they present her as, as a goof. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that that is all on WoW because if I was looking at her Instagram, she is very much a cosplay wrestler as well. So it may not be something that she wants to take all that seriously. I don't know. I'm just saying that I think the mileage in her or the, the the equity in her, however you want to phrase it, would be largely if she was presented as somebody who could get in there and get the job done. Rather than coming out in the cap and gown and the book and pointing at her head and think people, I'm going to teach her to read a book and all that you know stuff that she does. It, it just... <laughs> She is just silly. It's just silly. And then, you know, it'll start off that way, but then during the match at some point they have her do the strong person stuff and the domination stuff. But you got to be able to, to be presented as a real threat sometimes. Not just be silly. And I don't know if she's capable of doing that. I mean, first off, the name the class master is just absurd. What is a class master? I don't know anybody answer me on that yet. Like, Because if it's just a glorified name for a teacher, then they need another name. Anyhow. So they come out. And then the Dojo Defenders come out following that. And, of course, they have to use a lot of strikes during the match because, you know, if you have a gimmick such as the Dojo Defenders, you're obligated to show people that you know some version of martial arts. My issue was not that they had martial arts in their arsenal because they didn't invent that. That's, you know, stuff that happens in wrestling. Have a little background or something, you utilize it. We've seen it dozens, dozens, and dozens of times, if not hundreds. Somebody play football, very good chance he's going to utilize a football gimmick or something like that until they grow out of it. Martial arts gimmick, they'll use that until they grow out of it or it's just incorporated into what they do to where people don't look at them that way. They did not go around calling Ralph Van Dam Mr. Karate Master or something like that. It just so happened that he knew martial arts and he incorporated it into his thing, but that was it. They, they didn't lie. You know what we need to do? We need to give you a gi, and we need to give you a headband, and we need to make sure that everybody knows that you do karate. And that, you know, it's like, yeah, they did some stuff that helped illustrate that. But that was about it. 
it, it did not have to exist beyond there to where, all right, let's make sure that people know and call me the Karate Kid or whatever. The dojo defenders are that. They're just, they're paper thin. Not saying that the persons portraying them are, but the, the persona of the dojo defenders are paper thin. Like every other gimmick in a while. So anyhow. The match, is. this is another one of those matches where I say this is not really all that important. It's a cold match. It, it's not here for anything. Not leading anything, not didn't start a feud or an angle, didn't end a feud or an angle. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just here. That's pretty much all I can give it. So we have, as stated, the disciplinarian and the class master representing the dojo defenders. This is maybe the, the best version of winning streak that the disciplinarian has been on. I did say the last time that I saw her, which was in an episode against G.I. Jane, that uh, she looked emotional. And I, did, and I had heard that she had resigned from the company. And I still don't know if that's true because this could be part of the previous tapings, but I still have not seen any uh, verification on that. If anybody knows or has the picture of it or something like that, post it on there or send it to, send it to me or something. Uh so, the Heat, which one is this? I, I can, this is another one of teams. Like, I, I can't stand the, the tar, Kara Strike and Kara, I, I, you know what? I'm not even going to go through that. Let, let me not, uh, let me not make a fool of myself. I've missed not the names because I don't feel like looking it up. It's not that important. Uh, the one in the black. <laughs> she took the heat for the good portion of this match. Takes a dive to try to get through the class master's leg so she could get a, a pin in there. They had points in this match where the class master is illustrating dominant and, and power. And I thought that was great for her, and she should be that way. She towers over most everybody in there. But then she'd go and ruin it by ah, let me point at my brain and show how smart I am or, or something like that. She, she'll go and revert back into being silly. Same way at the end, especially at the end. She just reverts back into just being silly. And that's all like, pick a lane with that. Pick a lane and stick with it. So Dojo Defender Black is in there and she's taking on the the. Team IQ and she's fighting back. She got to give her credit. She's fighting from underneath. The other one I know is Tootie Lynn. I just don't remember her Dojo Defender name. <laughs> dojo Defender Black gets the, the tag. The Dojo Defender Silver. Silver gets in there. She starts cleaning up. Utilizes her strikes. Class master comes in there and and for a moment, her height is neutralized by Silver as she's, you know, a couple of forearm shots, ends Gary, charges in, gives a big, a nice looking uh, forearm shot in the corner. Also, a nice single leg in the corner. And then she hits the spinning DDT and you would think that she might be able to do it. But the size, the length, the height of the class master works her advantage because her legs are spread out underneath the, the bottom rope. Which on its own should be enough to, to break the, uh, the count uh, in some wrestling organizations, by the way. Maybe I shouldn't apply that in a while. But she does the what the thing that WoW needs. She gets her leg up and she puts it on the bottom rope. And both Samantha Smart and the disciplinary are like, look, 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 look. You know, it's just on the ropes. So the ref breaks it up. Class Mouse gets walked over to the corner. Dojo Defender Black comes in, and now both of them try to double team on the Class Mouse. And then this is where she has her, her muscle moment. They're trying to both send her into the ropes, and she stands her ground. She stops herself. And neither one of them are strong enough to move her, so she moves both of them. She just pulls back, and they both go running towards the ropes. Silver is yanked out of the ring by uh, Samantha Smart. And then Black, is, as the legal woman, gets caught in a choke slam. 
And that was it. One, two, three. She gets pinned. If I got more of that class master rather than the one that I saw in the beginning and the one that I see at the end, I would say that there's some money to be made there. But she won a few times in the match begins to wrestle technical. I was like, she shouldn't be wrestling technical. She should be power and she should look the the she should look the part. You could probably steal a couple of eyeballs if people believed that she was a a dominant force. I don't know if people buy her as a dominant force yet. She's been so up and down in her booking. When she got there, she was losing to everybody. And then slowly she worked into being, oh, I'm stronger than there. I'm taller, bigger, and stronger, so I'll just start being that, even though it's not consistent. So there are these moments where she has these little shining uh, rays of hope in the middle of a match, but then it just reverts back to, I'm the class master. Give me my cap and gown. You people need to read, you know, nonsense like that. So they got the win, and they stand proud and tall, and she does what she does and puts on the, the cap. And starts looking like an idiot. And then Samantha Smart gets on the microphone. And cuts a wild promo. This would be the typical heel wild promo. I have, I, I probably need to go back through some. But I have basically determined that if you relate the following information. You are probably good at cutting the promo in a while as a heel. We just won. We're better than everybody else. That's the first thing. Second, I need a shot at the title, fill in the blank or whatever title that is. Third, David McClain, you are stopping and or give me a shot. If you can relate those three things in the course of any after-match promo, you're probably good enough to talk in a while. They all basically do the same. Now, we're not talking about her delivery because her delivery has gotten much better, in my opinion. I think that she is growing into who Samantha Smart is. But what I also think is that she probably could not do that on her own and probably would not be capable if it were not written. Now, I don't know if it's written, but my gut at this point telling me that, yeah, this is stuff that's probably workshopped or written out before she steps out there. I would love to find out that I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, let me be wrong. But I, I think that this is, you know, this is just who she is. I don't I don't think that a, a improv microphone moment is part of her forte at this this time so they stick to the stuff that works for them what i just told you relay these three points you're fine she also missed her her spot to cheat in the match when uh they had dojo defender black hanging over the ropes and she took a kick at samantha smart and she backed up and then they pulled uh the defender to the ring and she she being smart took a little swipe but she missed so she She's still got some heel gr manager growing to do. Heels constantly blame David McClain. I've said this numerous times. Feels like every week because they always do it. This cannot go anywhere. I don't know how many different ways it can be said, but this cannot go anywhere. It's pretty much a pointless effort. But they'll keep doing it. Tara Strike is who that was. I did write that down. All right. So Tara Strike was the one that took the choke slam and got the got pinned, but uh, didn't matter. Like I said, this is a pointless match, and I don't know if any promo asking for a title or a title shot goes anywhere with Wow, babyface or heel. Now that I'm thinking about it. Unless it's somebody that Dave Klein just specifically likes, like the Beast. Other than that, I don't know if anybody else ever got the 
effort of having the management bend over backwards to try to accommodate their their, their wants, wishes, and dreams. <laughs> you know, now that I think about that, that does sound kind of unfair. <laughs> like Jesse Jones got screwed over, Princess Ozzy got screwed over. <laughs> The other people got to jump through hoops to get matches. Everybody except for the Beast. Beast, you deserve a shot. I'll take care of you. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, next segment is the Jay Boogie video package. Why did they have this now? They presented this like she just got there. It's a nice production. It looks good. But why are they showing us like... Hey, let's introduce you to this person. Let's introduce me. We've seen her for the last couple of weeks. Why am, I, why am I seeing this now? So, yeah. Uh, this is the, the point where I, I was talking about earlier, and I was waiting to get back to this. Nigel Zane said in the midst of this video that Jay Boogie wrestles like she's been wrestling for years. Okay, so... Nigel. 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 Come on. Come on. She wrestles like she's been wrestling for years. I know you got to say nice stuff on commentary. I've been there. But let's not go. Let's not go too far. Let's not overdo it. She does not look like she's been wrestling for years by any stretch of the imagination. She looks like she's competent. She looks like she can get there. She looks like she has enthusiasm for what she's doing. There's any number of ways that that could have been rephrased, but like she's wrestling for years, no. I am sorry, but I am going to have to disagree with you there, sir. And as a side note, you know what I just realized when I was going back through some of the videos on my channel? I probably was like three feet in front of Nigel Zane at one point and didn't even know it. I, I didn't, it, it didn't cross my mind because I was working at the show at the time. But at Deep South Wrestling, uh, I was covering an event, one of my favorite matches, which I did call the World versus Crystal Rose for the Shine Nova Championship. But at the beginning of that video, if you go look at it, there's a Nigel Zane standing there introducing the match. Which, again, did not cross my mind that he was, uh, that he was there until I went back and watched. And I, I'll even do you a step further, peel back the curtain just a little bit more. Considering the fact that I was a, I'm a one-man band, the person that you see working the camera, that's me. <laughs> Even though you hear me talking throughout the entirety of that, the, the guy wearing the camera with the Tim's on, yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, so <laughs> that's probably one of the few times I admit to that because I, I never really wanted to do the, the uh, I didn't want to break the illusion of the person that's shooting this on the video you're watching is actually calling a match on the video you're watching. Yeah. Yeah, you got to do that sometimes. Hey, it's TV, man, it's video. So in any case, the video packages, like I said, they, they they produce a nice package. Disagree with some of the stuff that was said. Lost a little credibility with me on that. But I'm sure you're not concerned about the credibility of me. Um, it, it's, it's a video that's kind of built around, oh, <laughs> I don't know what, what, what Wild likes to do, but it, it's almost like Wild likes to do this woe is me factor. Like, everybody has to have something in their past. Like, hey, no, I had to travel across the country and get on the bus. I get on there every day to go. You know, I, there's one thing I found that WoW lacks, and it didn't hit me until I was watching uh, an MMA fight. No one there speaks like an athlete. Everybody there talks as as if there's, this was a lottery and I won it. And I'm just happy to be here. Most of them do, not all. I shouldn't say all. But as you get a lot of that. And the hurdles I had to overcome to get it. Whereas, you know, in MMA, that, 
yes, when they're doing the profiles, they they talk about the adversity they overcome, but then they come out of that, and it, and it becomes almost like you're looking to have me. <laughs> you know, that I am God's gift to this thing, and I, I'm here at Bellator, blah, 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 blah. You, you don't. You don't get the the different varying degrees of personality with with wild video packages. It's almost all of them have an element of woe is me. But uh, somewhere within this, she makes claims on the wild championship. Uh, I wrote my notes right here that she shouldn't make claims on things that she's not going to get. I have a hard time, and I wrote down she will never get this championship. And you should, you should never say never in pro wrestling. That is absolutely true. But yeah, I'll eat those words if it happens. I, I'm, I'm sticking to this as of right now. I'm sticking to that. She will never get that championship. She won't get any wrestling championship. She won't. If she don't get it in a while, it's not going to happen at all because she's not going to wrestle any place else. I'm pretty sure that she's. Only in that company for that company. And that's pretty much where that's going to start and where that's going to stop. So, this falls under the same category as the recap of the beast earlier in the show. It was a nice video package, but it didn't push or promote anything. It's weeks too late. Introducing this person that's already been on the show for you know months at this point. It didn't illustrate anything else. It's talking about a promise that she's probably long away from if she can ever accomplish. It was just there. It didn't it didn't serve any purpose other than to fill out airtime. Next segment was a preview of Princess Ozzy taking on Genesis next week, which nah. I I feel like I would be fine with the match, but I also felt like WoW has no headline or main event talent. They have very good talent, main event talent in terms of in-ring work. That is there, and I would never take that away from you know the persons that are for the ones that are that. If you've listened to this at any given point, you know I I feel very highly about Jesse Jones as a as a worker. I I love her stuff. Love it. And she is main event talent. In my view, she might not be the most flashy person that that gets in the ring, but she in my world is main event talent. She's not presented as that. No one is. No one in the wild is presented as main event talent and in that being one more important than the next. Wow feels like it goes out of his way to try to keep everyone on the same playing field, more or less, with the exception of the Beast. She's probably the only one that gets presented like, well, she's just, you know, the Beast, she's a cyborg, she can do this and that and lift up buildings with her bare hands and, you know. She seems to be the only one that's, that gets anything remotely close to that. But outside of that, no. I mean, I just, when I looked at this preview, I, was like, I, I like Princess Ozzy and I like Genesis, but I I keep using the guys that walk in and out of the room, the coworkers that's there all the time. You know, I I keep using them as a barometer. And then I look at some people online, but uh, but I like seeing them in the room as the barometer because other than the fact that. Princess Ozzy, they found her attractive like there was no interest in the match. It was just, wow, she's pretty. And that's a problem. That can't be the selling point all the time because it wears thin. It gets casual views on it because there are going to be guys who are going to watch just because it's women in tights. And, yeah, being attractive works. It helps. I'm not going to deny that. But they can't, and I'm not saying wild leans into it. Actually, they don't. But they need to provide some other 
reasoning for people to want to see it. Angles, investing in the personalities, investing in their journey towards whatever it is that they're trying to do, be that revenge or accomplishing some other outside championship goal, accomplishing the championship goal. You know, reuniting with an old partner, breaking up with an old friend. Who knows? But it's, but those reasons are the reasons that people come back to it. I used the Jeff Jarrett thing a little earlier. That's reason enough to watch that tournament in and of itself. Can this man pull it off? He's in the twilight of his wrestling years. Can he do it? Against people that he's probably 25 years older than. At a minimum. Can he pull it off? Wild doesn't have any of that. And being an attractive person amongst a sea of attractive people does not really help. After, well, like I said, after a while, it, it, it wears thin. It's just one of. So, I mean, it, it was just a thought that passed my mind as I was watching this and I saw that. And, and then I thought, following that, I was like, wait, is the angle that she was in already done? Are we finished with that? Because I, I, I don't know. The next match has what should have cla- slash would have been her antagonist, Raina Del Rey, and her partner, Tormenta, but Princess Ozzy isn't around. So I don't know. Um, That indeed was the next match. It was Randa Ray versus Tormenta with Sofia Lopez and the ring announcers to stop doing that one fall thing. I know they find it fun and they're like falling constant schedule. Let's, if they're going to do it, just let them do it. But just, you know, that should be given a rest. We, we, I, let, let, let's try, try to move that along. And, you know, because when you do it, it feels like it's just yanking attention off of the match and putting it on the, the ring announcer. Just just call it a, the, the match. Anyhow, I mean, because look, she, she's, again, another pretty face amongst pretty faces. She's going to get somebody to look at her just because she's there. And she's got a sparkly dress on. We don't, we don't have to get something else to draw her attention to. Doing the holding the microphone up for them to say it doesn't help. If, <laughs> there, if the Mike is going to pick it up being held up in the air. Is going to pick it up while you're holding it in your hand where you were. Anyhow. Uh, Del Rey is without Andrina. Uh, Andrina. Adriana Gambino. Gotta say it right. She's come out without her. So I don't know what's up with this angle. Is in, in limbo, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Lopez is the baby face that she wanted to be. I think that is, sorry, microphone slip. I think that is very evident that this is where she wanted to be in the first place. Um, if you've ever seen her socials or you've seen her when she came out as Sophia Lopez, with the exception of when the bell rang, she wasn't really healed up all that much. Not heal, H E E L E D, not H E A L E D. She wasn't really healed up like that um, all that much. It was one of the first complaints that I had about her. And I, I like Sophia, but I was like, why is she coming out here handing out business cards and smiling at, you know, young children? Is confusing. Are you a heel or a baby face? And at the time she was supposed to be heel, she just didn't behave that way until it was like right in the middle of the match. And maybe a little bit afterwards. But this feels like this is everything that she wanted to be. She's back to, you know, out there smiling. She's changed her look. She's not wearing the wig anymore. She's got a, a more glamorous style dress. Still carrying the Halliburton briefcase, and now she's handing the business cards out again and back to where she was. But this time she could do it, and they can reciprocate. They go, hey, you know, they're, they're happy now. 
it it just feels like this is what she wanted to do in the first place. And she, I'm glad, if nothing else, that they went with the idea that she needs to be baby-faced. You cannot make the speech that you made and then turn around and come back here as a heel. If she's going to do that, it needs to be far removed from where she is right now, if ever. So they come out. And it's a nice look for her. I, I, I don't think anybody's going to argue that point. And it looks as if the Tormenta Lopez connection will remain, uh, at least going forward. This during this main event, they advertise uh, Siren and Chainsaw versus Twenty Spring Break Twenty Four Seven. They, they talk about that. I was like, hey, you don't want to miss it. I was like, I don't want to miss that. Seriously? That match? That's the match I don't want to miss? That goes back to what I just said. Wow has no headline of main event talent. I don't know why. If I were going to go off of the theory that Siren and Chainsaw are worth tuning in for, and they're probably more worth it than the other two, why would I tune in for Spring Break 24-7? It is a, they are a losing team. They haven't said a word about who they are or why they're there since they've been there. You only see them once in every blue moon. What about announcing that match would make anybody want to see it? Like, I, I don't have, I legitimately do not have a good answer for that. What about that match announcement would make people like, yeah, I got I think I want to watch that. Other than the fact that is what I said before, is women in tights. And somebody will look at it just based on that alone, but, but on the merit of drawing power, why would you tune in to, to that? If I just walked up to somebody and said, hey, Spring Break 24-7 is going to be wrestling a tag team match. You should watch them. And I'm sure after hearing who the hell are they, it would then turn into, okay, maybe. <laughs> Let me know if it's any good. And I'll catch you later. Or something like that. They, it, it, they just do not have the drawing power. And I don't know why that would be something that they would even bother to advertise in the middle of this. Anyhow, uh, when this match goes on, it is a very methodical match. Not a lot of fast pace stuff going on here, but I am now under the belief that some of that is by design, apparently, that um, certain potential individuals in management want the matches kind of uh, what's a nice way to say it? Basic or easy to follow. That 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 that's a good way to say. It. But there's not a lot of uh, problems other than the fact that I, I know that both of them have worked quicker paces elsewhere before. But Del Rey and Tormenta did fine. It just I I know I said this about um, Penelope Pink and uh, the Sierra Miss match. But there are times when I see matches that take place in wilds like this match is. I, I, I'm really hesitant. I don't want to say wasted all the time, but that's what it feels like sometimes. It feels like this is a match that's wasted in the wow. Some of that is because this is a cold match. Just like this is feels like it should have been something that was built to, uh, or you know, at the very least, maybe start something up. It was just a match, just for the sake of having a match. I can see if this went somewhere afterwards. And I could even see if they said they shot something earlier in the day and that caused them to have this conflict to want to do it. Or if they, this is where having a matchmaker that's on TV works. If you ever want to explain a cold match, you have a promotion with a recognized matchmaker that does that. And then you can always justify the match. But just to have it, I mean, like, Wild doesn't have a lot of time to just blow. So just to have a match that's cold without any sort of 
rhyme, reason, and explanation. I'm like, I, I don't know. It's just another reason why I say David McClain should be in the back as the recognized matchmaker rather than the guy that does everything. <laughs> so logic won't get jumbled up in things, but, you know, what do I know? Anyhow. So, Sophia Lopez is playing the role of the good babyface manager while we got Tormenta and Reina Del Rey in the ring. <clears throat> A lot that's going on in there. Tormenta looks like she's got a new lease on life, smiling a lot. You can see that even underneath the mask. Imagine that. Uh, I used the word methodical, and I would stand by that. Is They did make everything clear for the audience. I would imagine the live audience and the audience at large watching TV, they made it very easy to follow. And that goes back to, you know, there's a difference between having people who know what they're doing versus people who just memorize some stuff to do and went out there and start repeating it. I said you could see the smile through uh, Tormenta's mask, and you could. It's amazing that she could relate being the, the baby face you know, through the mask. Sometimes we, we tend to forget that <laughs> luchadors and luchadoras are able to do it too. And then you have the uh, facial expressions of Reina Del Rey as well. Even though she cheated. <laughs> or she tried to cheat several times. Yes, I see you cheating out there. Yelling at the people and whatnot. Shame on you. But uh, as <laughs> Speaking of facial expression, the facial expression of the one of my favorite spots in the match is the cross face that takes place there. Del, not Del Rey, Tormenta got it hooked in better than I've seen some guys do. For whatever reason, I don't know why the arm is always kind of like the loose point of application. But it looked like she had it in there pretty good. The, the, the reason that I like this is because I just said that she cheated and this is where she did it. Taking this woman's hand and biting it to get out of the hole. <laughs> Del Rey is illustrating that she didn't have the, the means to get out of it and technically, so she just put Tormenta's hand in her mouth and start clamping down on it. I was like, okay. So, I mean, it's a heel thing to do. I do what I can, and I do what I got to get out of this, this hole as efficiently and as quickly as I can do it. And Tormenta, you know, she got to give her credit, too. I mean, she, she's, like, not dancing in place, but, you know, you ever have something like burn your hand and you just kind of run in place for a little bit? <laughs> she, she sold the pain, like, ah, you know, the, all that stuff that was going on, so... I thought they were they, they had a little fun exchange in there. Uh it's weird seeing Sophia Lopez as a baby face still. Even with the new dress, even with the shorter haircut, is is it, it's not bad. It's just a little odd. It's like, okay, it's this woman who's been a, a heel in this company for like ten years, I get, you know, all of a sudden is is a baby face. But uh, you know, we go with it. So getting towards the end of this, we have the old exchange in the middle of the ring, which gets met with the double knockout clothesline spot. We can get past that at some point. Tormenta gets on the outside of the apron. She neck drops uh, Del Rey across the ropes. Goes around and she gets up so she can do the meteor off of the top rope. Now, this is one of the, the points why if I ever want to sell it to people about wrestling, that is the moment that I use right there. Because it's not the first time she's done it. But, you know, every when you see that move and they start to have the old, you know, they didn't do this right or this looks fake and da 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 I was like, I want you to lay on the ground and just let any one of these guys in the room just jump up and land on your shoulders. You just just tell me. I said, like, just, just, 
just the thought of that, the thought of a hundred pound human being or more flying down on you from six feet or better, <laughs> and you trusting that they aren't going to cave your goddamn skull in. You tell me where the fake is on that. So yeah, but yeah, that's why I was happy that she did it because you know you, you can all there's always that you can always use that little moment in the wrestling match like yeah, you you lay down and let somebody come flying down on you see how comfortable that is. It, they had to get used to it, but yeah, you 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 try that one time. Anyhow, so anyway, the match was won by Tormenta with the mirror off the top rope. One, two, three, she gets the pin. I think it's safe to say uh, Tormenta and Lopez are full babyface now. I don't know if they're going to continue on with Ozzy, but they look like they're, they are continue pairing, which then goes back to my logic, like, okay, well, now we're on the other side of the coin where Sofia Lopez has got cut loose from Las Banditas. And where she couldn't buy a win with Tormenta before, now she's winning. Because she is going over to the side of light. I guess. Uh, I have liked Tormenta since she got there, but let's be honest, Tormenta has been used very badly. She wasn't even kept in a winning position enough to be a viable top contender. They threw her in the top contender spot a lot. But you can almost bet your bottom dollar. She was in any multi-person match for a title or something important, she was going to lose, which is what she did. So to see her winning now, good for her. It just, like, did not expect this. I guess I should have because WoW was like that, but I didn't expect them to, you know, actually – Try to. Well, I don't even know if they're trying to do something with it. I mean, maybe, maybe I shouldn't speak too soon with that. They, they might just be having her win this match and go back to a 20-week losing streak. But as of right now, she's okay. But that was the show. That was the uh, episode in its entirety. Uh, there was a lot of go-nowhere matches and go-nowhere moments. Didn't really, didn't really lead to a lot of things. Didn't really close up a lot of things. I mean, I'm looking back at the list. Brat Pack, and the, you had that. Jay Boogie and Steffi Slays versus the Brat Pack. They, they pretty much started and stopped their angle right there. There's no reason to go any further. They might go further, but there's no reason to. Los Mendes versus Santilla Chella and Holla Dead. Nice, but it was a cold match. And it left me with questions related to Los Mendes and why they all of a sudden magically winning. Team IQ Superior versus the Dojo Defenders again. Cold. It's a sudden change of pace also for the class master who now is illustrating points of I have strength and dominance. And then there's the main event. Not really anything happening there beyond the fact that it was just a match. So whereas it was fine to see, and maybe this is who they're uh, writing for or booking for, it just... It was a match. It was a show that you could watch if you were just tuning in out of nowhere with no connection to WoW, didn't know anything about WoW or anybody in it. It would be fine for you to look at. Aside from that, I'm like, I don't know what to get from this show. It's just, it's just a show with a bunch of matches. And the one thing that they had at the beginning didn't didn't have a strong enough emotional angle to it for me to care that she won or not she being Jay Boogie I in theory you would think that okay she's been in this situation for so long that we're finally going to see her get her comeuppance and win 
but that wasn't the case. She just won. So, <laughs> boo. <laughs> it, 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 this is a non-graded show. I can't say A, B, C, D, F. No, I, this is just a non-graded show. It's just no grade. Just a, put, a, put a dash by it. It's done. Now, <clears throat> I am fully aware that by the time that this is heard, you probably would have likely seen the episode that I'm about to read the preview for. But since I genuinely like to do the previews at the end, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, my normal stuff, if you hadn't seen it, if you're tuning into it on YouTube and you don't know anything about it and you don't want to know anything about it, this is your time to skip. Still here? Then here we go. This is the preview for the next episode which will be 241 chronological number for me would be 93 the title is new predators and here's the preview darkness takes over as siren the voodoo doll and chainsaw are sent into the ring by angelica dante to battle the sunny spring break 24 7's crystal waters and sandy shore after team exile was fractured Ice Cold emerges alone to wrestle the resilient Ariel Sky, who's looking for her way back to the top. Another former Team Exile member, Exodus, faces bully buster Keita Rush in a rematch that is sure to make waves at WoW. Pressure builds on the Beast to maintain her spot as the toughest in WoW as a new challenger emerges. In the main event, Former WoW World Champion Princess Ozzy clashes with fellow Austrian superhero Genesis who aims to exile her back to the Outback. <sighs> like I said, that first match means nothing to me. <laughs> that is no reason that I would ever tune in. Uh, Aerial Sky and uh, Ice Cold. I'll have to wait and see that one, but it feels like the blind leading the blind. Exodus and Keterus could be interesting. I don't know who's there for the Beast to be a challenger. I talked about that a podcast ago. Like, who's there? They've run through everybody who could have been a viable option and maybe gotten some sort of interest in going against the beast she's already beaten them so who's left unless they get some new face in there I don't know and then the uh, main event Ozzy and, and Genesis we'd have to see where that goes I, I would expect that Genesis would be the one that would be pushed there but Time will tell. And I think that finishes things up. Not really as short as I would have thought I was going to get. I was trying. Damn it. I was trying. But I couldn't get it. Uh, so in any case, the normal stuff here. Thank you for tuning in to the show. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you that have tuned in and reached out and messaged and direct messages. Caught me on Instagram, Facebook, email. I really wasn't expecting what I got and the, and the uh, uh, comments on certain matches <laughs> uh, the, the nomination for me to be the Jay Boogie's president of her fan club I appreciate that too uh, but thank you for all of that uh, <clears throat> you know where to catch all of this if you're listening to it on YouTube you know you can always like, share, and subscribe if you uh, listen to it on your podcast you catch that on greater podcast platforms everywhere if you do not know where to get it from that point you can always go to wpnwrestling.com that is the website and the centerpiece and the nexus for everything that I do including a 24 hour 7 day a week stream that is there on the channel all the time it's on there right now you might be able to see some former faces that you may recognize some that you don't some you might know from wow some you may know from NXT, TNA, AEW, some WWE. But you have to tune in to see. If you want to go through the channel itself, 
never really talk about this, but if you're going to go through the channel itself and pick out some of those matches, you can always go to the YouTube channel and go down to our playlist of WPN Showcase. Those were all the matches. I think it got up to 89, 89 different matches. Well, it was actually more than that. 89 is how many that were numbered since 2013. So there you go. You got some uh, stuff that you can check out. You got some options. And I think we'll end on that note because I got to tune in for the next week and see uh, what I'm going to complain about there, especially after reading this preview. So on that note, this is Mr. Green saying that this is Mr. Green saying so long. And we'll see you on the next go around. Take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the WPN's Rights and Wrongs of Pro Wrestling. If you have questions or comments, please contact us via our Facebook or our YouTube channel at the Women's Pro Wrestling Network. If you're new to the WPN, feel free to subscribe to our channel and like our page. We appreciate your support. Thank you again for listening.